and welcome to our reviews and today we're doing another Hong Kong content review, this time concluding the Eternal Affairs Trilogy on um, the great uh, Criterion Edition box set, uh, brand new 4K scans on all three films. I uh, have done reviews on the first two movies and on the remake The Departed and this is the final chapter of the current state of the 2003 uh, Internal Affairs movie. Returning directors back from the first two entries and I, I do want to point out a mistake I made in the first two videos I did. Uh, that makes up between the director Andrew Lau versus the actor Andy Lau so thank you uh, Parry fan uh, for pointing that out. Uh, I'm just a bit of an idiot. I've made a huge mistake. I'll try and be more careful in the future. Any mistakes I make or kind of mispronunciations in terms of words or anything, uh, just take that as a I'm getting too excited or I'm just getting a little bit too into the actual film. The extras on these editions I don't think are the best they could be, if I'm being absolutely honest, overall kind of opinion on this set. Uh, I did watch the extras for two and three, and I think they could have really beefed them up with new interviews or kind of new insights into the film. They definitely are much more older, kind of archive or in in uh, interviews kind of thing but there is some pretty good extras and good insights into the film themselves. As mentioned it's released in 2003 same time as the second entry and as already expected kind of going into this third entry the third and final entry of the trilogy uh, this wasn't as good as the first two that, that's pretty obvious I think everyone kind of knows that you know third entries in any kind of trilogy or any kind of franchise is very difficult to kind of keep on that same level which is why you know you get kind of infamous kind of sequels but you very little get like an outstanding kind of additional sequel at a concluding chapter or additional kind of entry on top of the first two movies. The first two movies are of course fantastic and this one is unfortunately not nowhere near as good as the first two. However, saying that, Internal Affairs 3 still offers something quite unique and definitely doesn't do the same film twice over. The, all three films are quite different from each other and I can see where they were going in terms of the direction and I quite like what was actually offered. I just feel the execution, I just feel the pacing, and I just feel you know, some of those scenes doesn't quite work to what I would like it to be. So let's dive into Eternal Affairs 3. The third and final entry and conclusion of the trilogy decides to go more personal, decides to go more of a psychological route, more of a kind of a personal character journey, kind of storyline with a dual narrative going on. On the one hand, you've got a prequel aspect of the film with uh, Tony Leung's character coming back from the dead from the first movie, diving into his past uh, a day, a week, a month, uh, you know, various different kind of stages in his kind of life leading up to the events of the first movie and showing aspects of his character working for Sam and his interactions with the therapist character, which he had a bit of a connection with and a bit of a relationship as the film went along. That was teased in the first movie and they brought back that character also for this entry to kind of deep dive more into that. And being the fact it acts as a sequel also to the events of Internal Affairs 1, you have Andy Lau's character on the flip side, which is a kind of a couple of months after the events of the first movie and his and that aspect of the story is quite interesting kind of a compare and contrast between past and future and allows character at this point he's made up a kind of a fake scenario or a series of events that have happened they kind of recreate the ending of the first movie in kind of his perspective which I quite liked I thought that was quite unique in terms of bringing back those actors recreating a kind of a series of events that never took place in terms of the, the rooftop sequence and then obviously uh, Tai Long's characters in a death sequence kind of reenacted to his version of the events he is very much paranoid he's very much kind of lost his wife he's got killed in the way he just you know the wife wants, wants nothing to do with him uh, after her finding out what happened in those tapes from the first movie he's kind of lost his position temporarily as internal affairs agent he's kind of doing desk job you know duties at the moment until the investigation's underway and he's very much paranoid he's very much kind of like where's my chance where I, you know, I, I'm the good guy you know what's going on here I've done all this sacrifice I've done all these things in my life to get to this point and you know why is my second chance where's you know why am I losing everything why you know and his trajectory is so kind of delusional and so kind of you know paranoid and he's just so kind of lost in his own kind of mindset and he is paranoid and threatened by a kind of character to play by Lee Ah Lai, who is the third kind of main actor in this movie, who is playing the security kind of chief agent kind of thing, who works alongside the Internal Affairs Unit, and he's been there since the first entry, since the first movie, and they kind of reintroduce scenes with him having connections with Sam and having connections with this kind of arms dealer that's kind of making big waves with kind of within the kind of Hong Kong and underworld, and he has interactions with pretty much all the characters within the past and present 
within the movie. It's a brand new character that's been kind of inserted into the events of the first movie, at least, anyway, and you get to see his aspect. And he's more the kind of um, villainish kind of character in this one around, in terms of like, he's a bit of a villain character in the prequel, a bit of a villain character in the first, uh, in terms of the sequel aspect as well with Andy Lau's character. You know, the, the security chief character is very much on the tail of Andy Lau. He knows there's another mole within kind of Sam's organization. He knows he needs to fish him out, and he's kind of playing cat, kind of cat and mouse. Kind of. Andy Lau's character is taking none of this. He's kind of dressing up as Hitman. He's planting devices. He's staging a bit of a heist to get into kind of his safe to kind of find tapes, recordings that was established within the first movie from Sam and he's very much just kind of lost everything and he just thinks like I'm a good cop I'm in a position now where fight now I, I, I'm a good cop I can do good I can just need to get rid of this problem I need to get rid of this guy get rid of those tapes and I can feel better and I can get my second chance I can get my what's owed to me and this character thinks he's owed this character wants to be applauded this character wants to be kind of celebrated for his actions within the first two movies very much just completely lost his mind in this one and but he's also very smart he's also very calculated i love the kind of interactions between him and the security wing chief character and there's a really interesting kind of aspect of that kind of cat and mouse chase to it but also heavy psychological because he's also feeling massive massive guilt from what's taken place it's interesting on the flip side you've got Taron Lung's character which dives into more of the past events leading into the events of the first movie and showing his projective and his kind of more the happier ending that would have taken place if he managed to get out of the kind of undercover kind of business he'd been undercover for 10 years he's kind of sick and tired of it he's very stressed he's very angry but in those scenes and those moments bring that character back you explore a side of him that you never get to see you see his kind of day-to-day -day life his interactions with his friends and uh, the, the relationship that blossomed between him and the therapist character which is actually quite good and quite sweet but what makes those scenes interesting is that he's so happy and so joyful and so kind of jokey the, the, the extra interactions between him and Anthony Wong's character and that kind of um, catching those checks is really funny um, I really like the kind of the scenario that happens toward the third act of the movie where he's in a kind of a really intense kind of situation kind of a, with a double class kind of sequence going on and that leads into kind of something more positive and something more happier than I wasn't expecting he had something to look forward to his mission was to take down Sam to take down this organization to stop them all and to potentially have a relationship with this therapist character and his projective as a traditional kind of you know undercover cop was stressful was you know was very damaging psychological he's been there for way too long but he was a cop he was there to get shit done and you see that in aspects of the second entry as well him being shocked and kind of unbelievably disgusted by the events he has to take place doing drugs kind of you know um beating up people potentially killing people in the process and the fact that his goodwill of character his kind of good nature was always kind of present was always kind of shine through within his kind of actions the fact he's always smiling the fact he's always joking the fact he had good relationships with always his crew and his kind of undercover kind of police unit Anthony Wong's character plays really well into the kind of the downfall and the more paranoid psychological aspect of Andy Lau's character what lets the film down is just not that well executed I think the themes could have been a little tighter I think you could have got the scenes and the points of the film a little quicker I don't think it needed to be two hours I feel like they kind of just thrown in kind of every kind of last idea every last scrap of kind of you know, moments that we could possibly could think of, throw it on the screen. I think a lot of the kind of toe long scenes, even though I do like those scenes, and I do think they're quite interesting and they add more aspects to his character, I don't think all of them were needed. I do think some scenes work more than others, and that adds to the kind of pacing problems of the film, and the film just kind of drag itself in a little bit in places, and I do think it could have been a little bit tighter. I think it could have been an hour and a half, and it's something that I would revisit, and it's something that I think I would get more out of on kind of a second viewing. Uh, watching it alongside with the trilogy, I think it would be more beneficial for more multiple viewings. And I think the trajectory is right there. I do think it's a bit of a bumpy road in the middle, but once it gets to that kind of finish line, I do think it hits the landing quite well, and I think it's actually quite satisfying, uh, despite the kind of the issues I have with some of the cinematography, with some of the choices, with some of the kind of more quieter kind of downplayed sequence. I do overall internal affairs free, despite being nowhere near as good as the first two movies, I do think it's underrated. I do think it's actually quite unique. I do like the approach and doing something quite different compared to the first two. It's not doing the same thing twice or third time over. It's telling a more of a personal, kind of more of a character driven storyline, a dual narrative between past and future. While I do think it throwed in a lot of extra ideas and a lot of filler stuff and a lot of things that didn't need, really need to be in there, I do think it could have been a tighter movie. I do think it could have been executed a little stronger. I do think some of the cinematography and some of the music choices 
weren't as good, but I liked the trajectory of the two initial main characters. I do like seeing the new additional character and how his role intertwined into the overall conclusion in terms of past and future. Final moments with the two characters that we kind of know and love and seeing this kind of trajectory journey between the first two movies, I think it's quite satisfying. I do think it kind of wraps up all the kind of loose ends very well and I think it ends on a really good high note uh, in terms of what the trilogy has to offer and I think it's risky, it's a bit messy in places, sure, but I definitely think it's worth a watch. What are your thoughts and opinions on Eternal Affairs 3? Please comment down below. What are your thoughts and opinions on the overall trilogy? So in the meantime, guys, time for the reviews. Signing out. <laughs> Na yi duan. <laughs>